tonight change ahead japan in political uncertainty after voters deliver dramatic defeat to long time ruling party battle ramps up donald trump's rally draws apparent sell out crowd to new york's madison square garden cruise talks begin high stakes gaza ceasefire talks restart in doha as israeli strikes kill dozens in northern gaza and reeling authenticity Disposable cameras are making a major comeback as Gen Z and others embrace the nostalgic thrill of this olden device. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Derna World News Tonight reporting from Colombo. Here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Hello, very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Well, we have some key stories that developed during the weekend around the globe and we start off today's bulletin with the Japanese elections. The coalition led by Japan's luring Liberal Democratic Party has lost its majority in the parliament in its worst result in over a decade. The LDP and its much smaller coalition partner Komieto have taken 215 seats together, falling short of the 233 seat majority needed to govern. The party's new leader Shigeru Ishiba said there are no plans to expand the coalition at this stage. Ishiba, who called the election just days before he was sworn in as Prime Minister, has vowed to stay in office despite LDP's loss of the parliamentary majority. Now to get more details on the story, we have other than the world news special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa who is joining us from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita, how does the situation look over there after a controversial election result? Hello. Japan has a hung parliament now. The elect yesterday's election, uh, the polls were closed at 8 o'clock and by midnight, uh, most of the seats were known. The seats count were given and in the early hours in the morning today, uh, we knew how the uh, representative votes were given. So out of the 465 uh, uh, seats, the, the ruling LDP with the alliance, uh, the Kometo won around 215 and the rest 251 by the opposition parties. So Ishiba-san, in next few days, he has to make his maneuver. He has to make the numbers to get the 233. Uh, even though the results wasn't overly surprising, but the scale of the ruling LDP uh, defeat, uh, which they got about 190 seats, was not really expected in the media and by the political pundits because they believe even though the scandal hit LDP uh, were eventually able to get at least 200 seats. Uh, so with this hung parliament, the LDP and its coalition need further 18 to 20 seats to guarantee the majority. So how do they plan to get that? So this is a very tricky situation because mainly due to the, uh, the political, the unreported fund scandal they had, uh, most of the opposition parties do not want to join hands with the LDP. And even their, uh, the alliance, the, uh, the Kometo, actually, they had significant losses, including their leader's own seat. So uh, the main CDP, the leader, Nodasan, clearly indicated that they would not go for a coalition with the LDP. And they actually won around uh, 150 seats. Uh, uh, like far in line with the expectation or some would say they won uh, more than the expected seat especially in the first past the post uh, those 289 seats the the cdp won around 102. so we are going to have interesting few days until the next parliament session where the behind the scene maneuvers would take place to get the parliament majority over to you Thank you. That was Adha Dhanavar News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradas who joined us from Tokyo in Japan. <music> Moving to the Korean Peninsula now. North Korea's Defense Ministry blames South Korea's military for sending drones into its territory for political purposes, calling it an infringement upon the country's sovereignty. A spokesperson from North Korea warned the neighbor of merciless offensive if such a case recurs. Officials view the flights as political acts and a violation of the country's sovereignty. The North said South Korean drones flew over Pyongyang at least three times this month to drop leaflets. State media has also released photos of what it called a crashed South Korean military drone. Authorities said they had uncovered over 230 flight plans and logs, including one to spread, quote, 
political motivational rubbish. One record from early October purportedly showed a drone took off from South Korea at night and then dropped leaflets over the Foreign and Defense Ministry buildings in Pyongyang a few hours later. Responding Monday, the South Korean military dismissed the North's claims. Tensions between the Koreas have risen since the North began sending balloons, carrying trash into the South in late May, prompting the South to restart loudspeaker propaganda broadcast. Simultaneously, Seoul and Washington said North Korea has sent 3,000 troops to Russia for possible use in Ukraine, which could escalate the conflict there. Pyongyang said on Friday that any move to send its troops to support Russia would be in accordance with international law. Moving on to Mexico now, a fatal bus crash on a highway in the central Mexican state of Zacatecas killed at least 19 and injured six others. Traffic accidents in Mexico have been on the rise since 2020 when there were just over 300,000 accidents. The passenger bus which was traveling to the Mexico-US border city of Juarez collided with the back of a tractor trailer carrying corn that had become loose before rolling and falling into a ravine under the highway. The state attorney general's office said that it was carrying out investigations to arrest a driver of the tractor trailer. Mexico's National Guard and the Army were involved in the recovery operation to retrieve the remains of victims. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news coming right after this. On the road to the White House now, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has rallied his Make America Great Again base at an event in New York City. There he vowed to crack down on migration while slamming his Democratic rival Kamala Harris. Just nine days until Election Day, former President Donald Trump trading the critical neck-and-neck -neck battleground states for his deep blue home state of New York. Lines stretching outside his rally at Madison Square Garden, branded the world's most famous arena, known for Knicks basketball games and star-studded concerts. It's here in New York where Donald Trump built his business and where he was indicted and convicted in May of falsifying business records. Tonight, the former president returning to deliver his closing message. We're going to defeat Kamala Harris and we're going to win back the beautiful White House and we're going to make America great again. In recent days, Trump leaning into his signature issue of the border, declaring the influx of undocumented immigrants has soured the country. Tonight's rally kicking off with one comedian comparing Puerto Rico to an island of garbage. Vice President Kamala Harris today slamming Trump's rhetoric, calling it dark and divisive. Today, Trump's running mate Senator J.D. Vance agreeing with Trump that some of their Democratic political opponents are a bigger threat than foreign adversaries. Meanwhile, the United States President Joe Biden delivered an apology for the state policy that forcibly separated generations of indigenous children from their families for more than 150 years and sent them to federally backed boarding schools for forced assimilation. U.S. President Joe Biden formally apologized to the Native American community on Friday for the U.S. government-run boarding school system that physically, emotionally and sexually abused hundreds of Native American children. An apology Biden called long overdue made him the first U.S. president to issue an apology for the program, which lasted for 150 years before it was shut down in 1969. Now, Biden described the abuse that happened at boarding schools, which were intended to assimilate American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian children as a blot on American history, while calling it a sin on our soul. Now, according to an Interior Department investigation, at least 973 Native American children died in these schools. Moving on to the Middle East tensions now. Israel continued bombing military sites in Iran. The retaliatory attack, however, did not target the most sensitive oil and nuclear facilities and drew no immediate vows for vengeance. 
Iranian media showed air defences firing at projectiles over the skies of Tehran. It was not clear whether the overnight strikes would trigger further escalation. In a region already on fire with conflicts in Gaza and Lebanon, Israel's military said scores of jets had completed three waves of strikes before dawn against missile factories and other sites, in retaliation for an Iranian attack this month. It warned Iran not to hit back. Fears of an escalation between the heavily armed foes have soared since October 1st, when Iran launched around 200 ballistic missiles at Israel, killing one person in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, in response to earlier Israeli moves. Israel notified the United States before striking, but Washington was not involved in the operation, a US official told Reuters. Shaharam Akbarzadeh of Melbourne's Alfred Deakin Institute said it wasn't in Iranian leaders' interest to escalate further. The streets of Tehran appeared busy on Saturday. Tehran said its air defences had successfully countered the attack, but two soldiers were killed and some locations suffered limited damage. A semi-official Iranian news agency vowed a proportional reaction to the Israeli strikes, though Israel's military did not change public safety restrictions across the country in a sign it did not expect an immediate Iranian response. A senior Biden official said Israel's, quote, targeted and proportional strikes should be the end of direct exchange of fire between the two countries, but that Washington was prepared to once again defend Israel if Iran should choose to respond. Amid ongoing attacks between Hezbollah and Israel, ceasefire negotiations in the Israel-Gaza conflict resumed in Qatar today. The officials said that the negotiations will seek a short-term ceasefire and the release of some hostages being held by Hamas in exchange for Israel's release of Palestinian prisoners. Negotiations to advance a ceasefire deal in the Israel-Gaza conflict have resumed in Qatar. According to reports, CIA Director William Burns and the head of Israeli intelligence service Mossad arrived in Doha to meet with Qatar's prime minister to discuss a hostage release deal. On the same day, Egypt publicly proposed a two-day ceasefire, during which four Israeli hostages in Gaza would be exchanged for Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails, followed by more negotiations within 10 days aiming for a complete ceasefire. On Saturday, the Israel Defense Forces announced that it targeted aerial defense systems and missile manufacturing facilities in Iran in retaliation for Iranian attacks on October 1st. Iranian state media reported that around five people were killed in the strikes, including one civilian. In what other countries, including the U.S., hope will be the end of hostile exchanges, Israel's prime minister said that the strike severely harmed Iran and that Israel had achieved all of its goals. Meanwhile, Iran's supreme leader commented that the attack should neither be exaggerated nor downplayed, but he did not call for retaliation. Hezbollah and Israel continue to exchange attacks on Sunday, with Hezbollah announcing a strike on a military site in Israel's northern coastal city of Haifa. They also issued a civilian evacuation order for border areas, marking the first such directive by Hezbollah since the conflict began. According to Israeli sources, some of the 75 rockets fired from Lebanon were intercepted, but a 57-year-old woman was seriously injured. On the same day, the Israeli military ordered civilians in 14 villages in southern Lebanon to evacuate north before launching airstrikes. The Lebanese Health Ministry reported that at least 21 people were killed on Sunday in Israeli strikes on three different areas in southern Lebanon. Over in Georgia, now the ruling party Georgian Dream received more than 54% of the vote in a parliamentary election with more than 99% of proceedings counted. The result cast it as a watershed moment that would decide if Georgia moves closer to the West or leans towards Russia during the Ukraine war. Georgia's most powerful man claimed victory in an election on Saturday, according to early official results. With 70% of precincts counted, those results show the ruling Georgian Dream Party had won 53% of the vote, the Electoral Commission said. The results do not include most ballots cast by Georgians living overseas. The Georgian opposition initially also celebrated victory, and some monitors reported election violations. But a parallel count operated by one of the opposition parties showed Georgian Dream in a strong position to win a majority. Though it lost out to the combined opposition in parts of the capital, Tbilisi, it won margins of up to 90% in some rural areas. However, opposition parties are contesting the results and said they would not accept them, with the leader of the Coalition for Change party calling it a quote, constitutional coup, according to the Interpress news agency. 
Georgian Dream's billionaire founder Bidzina Ivanashvili, the opposition and foreign diplomats had cast the election as a watershed moment that would decide if Georgia moves closer to the West or leans back towards Russia. Ivanashvili told a crowd in Tbilisi that, quote, It is a rare case in the world that the same party achieves such success in such a difficult situation. This is a good indicator of the talent of the Georgian people. Ivanishvili, who made his fortune in Russia in the 1990s, came to power in 2012 advocating pro-Western views alongside a pragmatic policy towards Russia. He's since soured on the West, accusing a global war party of seeking to drag Georgia into war with Russia, even as he insists Georgia is on course to join the EU. If victory for Ivanishvili's dream party is confirmed, it would be a blow to the EU's hopes of bringing more former Soviet republics into its orbit. McDonald's said that beef patties in its quarter pounder burgers are the source of the E. coli outbreak, which has killed one and sickened about 75. The United States Food and Drug Administration continues to believe that the slivered onions from a single supplier are the likely source of contamination and McDonald's will resume selling the quarter pounder at affected restaurants. McDonald's said Sunday that beef patties in its quarter pounder burgers aren't the source of the E. coli outbreak, which has killed one and sickened about 75. The fast food chain says it's certain that any contaminated food has been removed from its supply chain and is no longer in restaurants. The Colorado Department of Agriculture said all samples of McDonald's beef patties tested negative for E. coli. They added that beef testing is done and they don't expect more samples. U.S. fast food chains have removed fresh onions from their menu after they were identified as the likely source of the outbreak. E. coli is killed in beef when cooked properly, but the McDonald's quarter pounder includes raw sliced onions. Affected restaurants are now serving the burgers without those onions. Since the incident, McDonald's has removed a quarter pounder from about 20% of its U.S. restaurants. Previous E. coli outbreaks have hurt sales at big fast food chains as customers stay away from affected outlets. McDonald's said it would soon start serving quarter pounders again, and they should be in all restaurants over the coming week. Well, this is a short commercial break now. Mobile news coming right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Once cast aside in favor of the instant satisfaction of cell phone photographs, single-use disposable cameras are making a comeback. Fans say they like this device's nostalgic authenticity. From Snoop Dogg at the Olympics to Hope Walls at the Democratic National Convention, suddenly disposable cameras seem everywhere. One, two, three. <laughs> For photographers and friends Allison Blackman and Asia Villacres. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> it's all about the look and the experience. We set yeah. out to shoot a few rolls. Two, one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. At one of the most one, photographed two. places in LA. Let's hope it's in frame. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to the camera we're all carrying in our pockets. Unlimited pictures. The yeah. quality is better. It's the vibe. It's, it's the, the vibe. vibe. According to Kodak Moments, it's more than just vibes. Sales of the company's single-use cameras have doubled over the last five years, driven largely by millennials and Gen Z. It's social media. They're seeing it on uh, TikTok. Phil Stebley owns a darkroom in San Clemente, California, where his lab technicians process and recycle two to 300 disposable cameras every single day. And then there's the wait. Each print, a time capsule into the past. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. We will be back tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Well, stay tuned as we got Anuradhi Vikramasinghe joining you next on the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a very good night.